When we talk of deadly hitmen, what frequently comes to mind is career assassins working for infamous organized crime groups. But this case is different in many ways. First, he is a devout Christian. And secondly, he carried out hits for the Brazilian government and not for any criminal organizations. Today's episode narrates the story of Julio Santana, a Brazilian village boy who rose to become the deadliest hitman the world has ever known. Santana was born and raised in a remote Brazilian village in the heart of the Amazon rainforest. He lived in a hut with his parents and two brothers. From his early teenage years during hunting parties, Santana would calculate various ballistic factors regarding deviating effects of wind and gravity and hit targets of different sizes from a great distance with remarkable accuracy. Santana was known as a good shot, and everyone believed he would make a great hunter. Indeed, he made a great hunter, just not the kind of hunter the village folks had in mind. In 1971, Santana, then 17, received an urgent summons from his uncle Cicero, a police officer in Porto Franco in the Brazilian state of Maranhão. Santana's reputation as a skilled shooter had preceded him. After a brief conversation, Santana was shocked to learn that Uncle Cicero was not a simple policeman, but also a professional assassin looking to outsource some of his contract killings to his young nephew. At the time, Santana led a devout Christian life, and all he ever killed was rodents and wild birds for food. He expressed concerns about how his spirituality would be impacted by the guilt of murder. However, Cicero was able to convince Santana that God would forgive him for the killing, provided he said 10 Hail Marys and 20 Our Fathers. Also, Santana was convinced to accept his first job on moral grounds. He was asked to kill a local fisherman, Antonio Martins, aged 38. Martins allegedly raped a 13-year-old girl in a nearby village. The girl's father sought revenge and hired Uncle Cicero to kill him. Martins is said to have tricked the girl, promising to take her to see the Amazon River dolphins before raping her in his canoe in the middle of the Tocantins River. Cicero further explained to young Santana how lawlessness has been the order of the day for over a century and how people were taking advantage of the chaos to abuse helpless children. When Santana heard this, he was enraged and agreed to do the job. He agreed to do just this one job for his uncle and call it quits. Santana took shelter under a forest canopy on a hill. He waited for three hours before catching sight of Martins as the fisherman climbed on his boat and arranged his net for his regular routine. 17-year-old Santana dropped to his left knee, placed his right elbow on his hip, held firm his hunting rifle, and pulled the trigger, hitting Martins on the chest as he stood on the wooden boat. Martins was an easy target as he was just 40 yards away. After falling dead at the bottom of his boat, Santana rushed to his victim and threw the body into the river to be devoured by schools of piranhas. Santana was devastated by the whole event and swore to himself that never in his life would he take another man's life. But he was seriously mistaken, for he was just getting started. Over the months that followed, his uncle reached out persistently to offer him another murder contract, but Santana declined. His resolve to quit the killing game gradually diminished over time by his uncle's persistence. Eventually, through his uncle's connections, Santana was contracted by a high government official as a guide to track down communist insurgents in the Araguaia River Basin in the Amazon. The insurgents, known as the Araguaia guerrillas, were determined to topple the Brazilian government. The rebels established strongholds and encampments in the heart of the forest. They recruited local farmers and fishermen into their ranks. Santana, then 18, spent months tracking and capturing several militants and one of their leaders, Jose Genuino, a radical law student at the Universidade Federal do Chiera. Santana watched in horror as the soldiers tortured and drowned many of the captives. Santana also shot and killed several militants, including Maria Lucia Petit, a 22-year-old schoolteacher who was declared missing in June 1972. Her disappearance remained a mystery for over 20 years. Her body was wrapped in an old parachute and dumped in a mass grave in a dusty cemetery. Throughout the 1970s and the early 1980s, Santana worked as an assassin for the Brazilian government, targeting politicians and insurgents who opposed the dictatorial military regimes. Santana was the main hitman for the government of Emilio Garastazu Medici from 1971 to 1974 and the government of Ernesto Beckman Geisel from 1975 to 1979. Santana's uncle Cicero continued to act as the middleman between Santana and the government officials who ordered the hits. 
He was paid an average of about $80 per hit, which at the time was equal to the monthly wage of an average Brazilian civil servant. He kept a diary and took meticulous notes of each contract, writing down details of the person he murdered, the person who ordered the killing, where the hit took place, and how much he was paid. After restoring civilian rule in the early 1980s, Brazil enjoyed a moment of peace and political stability. Santana's victims quickly turned from political targets to Brazilian garimperos. These are violent gold miners who pillage the Amazon forests beyond the reach of the law, enslaving children and contaminating the rivers with the mercury that the miners used to separate the gold from the mud. For many years, Santana championed the fight against the proliferation of illegal mining sites in Brazil. He was also often hired to kill cheating spouses. In 1987, Santana was arrested by the local police for killing a woman suspected by her husband of having an affair. He spent only one night in detention, thanks to his friends in high places who would not risk him being tortured into confessing to other crimes. During that time, Santana happened to be in touch with a high-ranking government official. Only then did he realize that the $80 which he received per hit was just a tiny fraction of what was actually paid to his uncle for his jobs. This implied Uncle Cicero had been defrauding him for many years. He confronted his uncle about it, and that was the last time he was in touch with him. Filled with frustration and increasing wearisomeness about his blood-drenched career, Santana stopped keeping track of his kills. His diary had 492 entries. Nevertheless, he still hired himself out directly and carried out a few dozen more hits until 2006, when his wife gave him an ultimatum to either give up that life or forget about her and their four children. Santana's wife worked as a waitress in a bar. She supported the family while he transitioned into a regular job. Santana managed to keep his line of work a secret from his parents before they passed away, and even from his children and close friends. Today, he lives in a small town in rural Brazil, where he owns a small farm and grows vegetables for sale. He won't mention the name of the town and has also refused to have his photo taken. Jose Genoino, the radical law student at the Universidade Federal do Chiera, whom Santana captured during the insurgency, became a congressman in 1982 after the restoration of a civilian rule and was made president of the Workers' Party in 2002. In a recent interview, Genoino confirmed that he remembers the boy that captured him in the Amazon during the Araguaia guerrilla movement in the 1970s. Santana was only 18 at the time. With over 500 kills throughout a 35-year period, Santana is probably the deadliest contract killer in history. However, he is more of an inadvertent career assassin who carried out most of his murders under the protection of corrupt dictatorial regimes. The volatile political climate of the 1970s and 80s in Brazil and the government's quest to obliterate all rival factions steadily provided Santana with hit contracts that amounted to over 500 killings. To conclude, Santana was a good shot, but never a typical gangster or street criminal with astute killer instincts. Unlike Santana, prominent organized crime hitmen like Harry Strauss, Juan Velasquez, and Pino Greco used a variety of methods, including shooting, stabbing, hanging, drowning, live burial, and strangulation to carry out hundreds of murders for criminal gangs and used unconventional tactics to evade law enforcement. This explains why Santana doesn't feature in our list of the 10 most prolific contract killers in organized crime history. Please check out the video using the end screen right here. Thank you for watching, and please do not forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell for more videos on crime stories, notorious outlaws, and historical scandals.